Welcome to Nordic Talks Japan. Uh, Nordic Talks Japan is a series of dialogues between the Nordic countries and Japan in order to act to inspire and inspire to act in tackling the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. The Nordic Talks Japan series is a joint effort with the Nordic embassies in Japan, the Finnish Institute, uh, Nordic Innovation House, as well as our local partners. Today's event is a hybrid event. Uh, we have guests here at our partner venue at University of Creativity. Thank you for having us, as well as many of you uh, joining us online. Today's discussions will be held in English. If you wish to follow the simultaneous uh, interpretation to Japanese, if you are with us at the venue, please grab a receiver from the reception. Or if you're joining us online, uh, please select the right language from the toolbar. Today's discussions will last for about 90 minutes. Uh, we will have opening and closing remarks from Nordic ambassadors uh, to Japan, and in between a fascinating and important panel discussion about women in STEM and breaking through the glass ceiling. On behalf of all the organizers, thank you very much uh, for joining our Nordic Talks today. And uh, without further ado, uh, for opening remarks, Ambassador from Finland to Japan, Ambassador Jaskelen. Minasama, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, konnichiwa. My name is Tania Eskelain, Ambassador of Finland, and I have a great pleasure of opening this uh, event uh, today. And welcome you to the Nordic Talks also uh, on our behalf. Uh, the topic of uh, today, women in science going through glass ceiling, is of course super interesting. And this Friday, we are all going to uh, celebrate uh, the International Women's Day. But we in the Nordics are so keen on this topic that we couldn't wait until Friday. So we, it's only Wednesday, but we are already talking about it. We can't, couldn't just wait so long. No, but seriously speaking, uh, despite of all the hard work towards uh, a world free of bias and discrimination, the truth is, that we're still far away from a complete, equal, and inclusive uh, world. A world where difference is celebrated, encouraged, and valued. And today's Nordic talks will focus on one specific area where bias still often occurs. Women in science, or more precisely, women in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In the Nordics, uh, Nordic countries, STEM subjects are still predominantly uh, taken up by male students, with women accounting for one third of graduates in the field. However, at the same time, uh, the Nordics topped the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index, so there is a dilemma there. Despite all the efforts to improve the situation, the Nordics still lack gender parity in the field of STEM, and we face the same uh, problems of male bias and gender segregation as uh, many other countries. I've understood that in, in Japan, only one in seven scientists are women, according to World Economic Forum, and women account for about 16% uh, 16 of, of graduates in STEM fields, according to the OECD. Given that Japan is, is um, at the same time one of the leading countries in science and technology worldwide, the absence of talented female scientists will not contribute to the economy and more innovations and uh, increased uh, productivity. What is then preventing women from entering the STEM fields? Well, I guess there are many explanations to it, uh, but according to a survey done by Professor Joan C. Williams, an expert on, expert on social inequality and the founding director of the Center for Work-Life Law at the Univers University of California College of Law, there are several biases that keep women out of uh, STEM. First, women feel that they need to behave in a masculine way in order to be taken seriously. And yet, they are also expected to be feminine. Second, uh, if a woman scientist have, wants to have children, the commitment to their work and also to their competence, especially after they have returned from maternity leave, 
is often questioned. And third, um, she mentions many women have experienced that they need to prove their knowledge, their expertise over and over again. Well, I leave it uh, to you to agree or, or disagree, and we can talk about that uh, later on. But of course, there is hope, and there are role models in our countries, women who have broken the glass ceiling in despite of the pre prevailing image of male-dominated field. And today, this Nordic Talks will focus on sharing the stories of these women, how they have gotten uh, to their current positions, what kind of obstacles they have encountered, their advice for the future female scientists, and what we can learn from their experiences. Now, it, might, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce uh, today for you today's distinguished uh, panelist. And I start by our Icelandic representative, Halla Hrund Logadottir. She is the Director General of Iceland's National Energy Authority and teaches the Arctic course at the Harvard Kennedy uh, School. Ms. Logadottir is also the founder of the Arctic Innovation Lab a platform established to encourage solution-based dialogue on Arctic challenges and has collaborated with entrepreneurs, politicians, and policy leaders across the region to, to drive change. And then uh, Finnish representative, Ms. Kristina Jokinen, she will be joining us online. Uh, Kristina Jokinen is a senior researcher at the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, AIST. She's also a adjunct, adjunct professor at the University of Helsinki. And her research has focused on conversational AI and multimodal human-computer interaction. Wow. Third, we have Professor Hiromi Yoka Yokayama from Japan, and she's a professor and deputy director of Kavli Institute for Physics and Mathematics of the Universe, Kavli IPMU at the University of Tokyo. She has conducted research on the ethics of AILC, the sociology of uh, big science, trust in science, and STEM. Gender. Wow, impressive. And then finally, we have moderator Ryan Takeshita. Ryan is the chief global editor and vice president of uh, at Pivot, a Tokyo based media uh, startup uh, focusing on, on business, entrepreneurs, innovation, sustainable economy, and global issues. Pivot's mission is to deliver fascinating stories and, and live online programs to help build Japan's startup ecosystem, boost innovation, change work culture, and tackle global issues uh, like climate change from a business uh, perspective. So, uh, dear guests, uh, finally, uh, before starting, I'd like to thank our hosts today, the University of Creativity, uh, for again hosting uh, this series of Nordic Talks in this wonderful and inspiring uh, location that uh, truly encourages uh, interactivity. Many thanks to our today's organizers, Embassy of Iceland and the Finnish Institute in Japan, and also to the Nordic Innovation House, as well as to other uh, fellow uh, embassies, Nordic embassies here. Thanks for sharing and organizing this inspiring uh, series uh, again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to hand over uh, to uh, Mr. Takeshima, Takeshita. Sorry, um, I give uh, the, you the floor, and uh, please take it uh, forward uh, from from here. The stage is yours. Arigato gozaimashita. Thank you so much. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Takeshita. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for the wonderful remarks. And I also agree that we should not wait until Friday, the International Women's Day. We should start talking now, this Wednesday, because uh, the glass ceiling in the STEM field is such an important po topic. We need to act as soon and fast as possible. So today we have a wonderful guest from Iceland, Finland, and Japan. And so this is what I want to do. I don't just want to talk about just challenges or the problems, but also the solutions. 
So everyone here listening to this topic, when we wake up on Friday morning, the day of International Women's Day, we know what to do. So we want to get solutions from each uh, one of our panelists. So without further ado, I want to start by introduction of each panelist. And could you give us your name and also what you are doing in your professional life to tackle the glass ceiling and the STEM fields? How that, can I start with you? Yes, uh, first of all, how fantastic it is to be with all of you here and how exciting it is to yeah. be here in Tokyo. Um, um, I want to say, uh, start by saying, my name is Hatla Hrund uh, I'm the Director General of Iceland's National Energy Authority. And like in most countries, energy sector is one of the male, most male dominant ones. And that is the same situation in Iceland. It's one of the few sectors where we actually have uh, not a lot of women. Um, I'm, for an example, the first woman to serve in my role, and thus I take uh, uh, the responsibility of promoting other women very seriously. Um, and I do that mostly through a project that is called Project Girls for Girls. And Project Girls for Girls started uh, uh, in a very simple way. There were a few women that came together from different parts of the world and we realized that despite women having the rights to run for office, you know, having the rights to serve in different roles in, in uh, universities and, and other fields, they're not kind of getting to the top positions. So despite the rights, as we know, there's something else, some cultures, systems holding women back. And uh, to respond to this issue, we designed this program. And the program is basically a mentorship program. We pair people up, young women, together with a more senior expert, like I have here uh, on my site, uh, as role models. And the, the girls go through different sections of topics, uh, focusing on arts of communication, focusing on negotiations, and other skills that can be useful uh, when you're trying to solve issues and trying to navigate uh, how to move forward uh, in different areas. So that is basically the short version of, of uh, how I commit my time in, in promoting women in, in the energy sector and other sectors as well. Wonderful. How long has the pro uh, project been around? Yeah, so it started in 2017. We were eight or nine that came together. Um, uh, from different parts of the world, and um, today we're operating in 33 countries. Wow. Also in Japan? Or? No, no, we're not missing yet. out Japan. Missing Japan. <laughs> you know, speaking about action items, we have one there already. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we are in 33 countries, mm -hmm. um, and we've mentored uh, 10,000 girls already. Wow. Through 1,000 mm -hmm. uh, mentors. Mm -hmm. So, but the potential and opportunity is huge, and we've seen uh, such a big impact that this can have because mm -hmm. you know often you just need to mirror things to and and ha get an experience and an ally to to make progress. That's a part of of this difficult mm -hmm. challenge, even though it won't solve everything. And I really hope Japan should be the thirty fourth country. Well, I'm hoping that will happen tomorrow okay. on <laughs> Women's Day. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. So, Christina, uh, it's your turn. So. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you yes, perfectly. Uh, okay, yeah, so great. Uh, I'm also very happy to be in the, in this panel and uh, um, uh, talking to you about these uh, very important uh, aspects. My background uh, is uh, more in uh, science and technology. I've always been very much interested uh, in uh, issues. My first degree was in physics. I was in, immensely enjoyed geometrical problems at school, etc. cetera. And, um, uh, on the other hand, I always have this inclination to humanities. And I think one of the important things uh, that we also need to do is to, to try to combine um, the uh, STEM with this kind of intercultural communication that supports equality, uh, well-being, and all the opportunities to develop, uh, create uh, experimentations uh, to a better life. Um, I'm uh, uh, involved in two professional networks, basically um, uh, working through the, the work. Uh, one is women in AI and another one is women and speech. 
both groups believe that it's a power of our community uh, to uh, which is based on kind of mutual support uh, caring and sharing and bringing awareness of these issues and we also want to inspire and educate the next generation so it's important to bring certain kind of role models and to pave the world uh, um, the, the road uh, towards an uh, equal uh, world. And uh, I'm happy to tell you more about my experiences. And uh, I think it's a great thing that you said, we need to look uh, for the future. Uh, that uh, is very uh, important uh, when we think about these, uh, these issues uh, going forward. Uh, thank you, Christina. Thank you. So you're joining us from Finland right now or? Actually, uh, I'm organizing a conference and I am in Sapporo. Oh, Sapporo, uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. but uh, it was a bit too far uh, to, to come uh, back uh, there um, for this uh, um, yeah. getting time. <laughs> but thanks for joining uh, even in a busy schedule. Thank you so much. Okay, Hiromi-san, you. you're next. Yes, thank you. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hiromi Yokoyama from the University of Tokyo. I, I am a sociologist, a, a scholar of the uh, science technology studies, and the, I have been studying about the STEM gender issue for seven years. And the, it's very good, uh, big pleasure for me to attend this panel. And the, uh, six months ago, I visited to Finland, Yubasuke University, and the, I studied the collab new collaboration between the uh, fin Finnish uh, scholars, uh, and it's a very good, uh, big pleasure to attend this meeting at the end panel. And the, um, I myself graduated physics department and get the PhD from the field of uh, particle experimental physics. And after that, I changed my specialty and study about uh, uh, relation between the society and also our STEM field. And the, so, as already uh, mentioned about it, uh, in Japan, uh, female ratio of the STEM field is very, very uh, low. So uh, we hope to uh, research about it, and the, I hope to uh, show something uh, to the, uh, uh, how can we uh, solve this big problem uh, with you, and thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Hiromi. So Christina talked about AI, and you also uh, study about AI and ethics. So why do you think AI, uh, being AI very uh, gender equality is important in the AI field? Uh, of course, uh, it's the very big uh, emergency technology, and the, so uh, so in Japan, the uh, ratio of the research and the tech especially technology field is uh, female ratio is very very low, and ethics is very important for all of us, and it means so we have to join, and female researcher is uh, more uh, have to join that kind of field, and not only that kind of our. Uh, uh, perspective, but the, I'm very interested in the ethics itself, and the, I collaborate with uh, ethics scholars also, and they develop some uh, good questionnaire for not only Japan but also the uh, all the world, and so that's my uh, interesting. Mm. Okay, thank you, Hiromi. So uh, I want to start off the discussion by kicking off by asking each panelist, uh, so we can stay on the same page, uh, by asking. What kind of experience, personal experience, have you witnessed during your professional career that you met, kind of, you noticed uh, glass ceiling in the STEM field? Any, can I start with you, Hannah? How long time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> we have an hour or yes? <laughs> no, I want to start, if I can just comment sure. on, on uh, what my colleague here said. I think, you know, what is interesting now when you have these big transitions like in AI and in the energy sector, how important it is that women are participating uh, in such big transitions so women are a part of the design and the outcome and the future as well, uh, just to comment on that. But about the glass ceiling and kind of facing adversity uh, during uh, one's career, I will say that when I started to think, to think about this, so many things came up. So I, I, I turned this all around and, and started to think, what are some of the moments that have actually, you know, given me courage to, to continue when I'm facing these challenges. And the, the key memory that always comes back to my mind is from an age of 14, you know, way back, a few years ago, if few you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
then I was um, uh, working on a farm in the southeast of Iceland. And uh, there were certain roles on the farm that were very male dominant, like driving the tractors. All the cool things were basically male dominant. And I really wanted to uh, have these roles. Uh, and I knew that if I would ask for it, I would probably get the answer, no, 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 you, you do this task. So I teamed up with uh, a, a guy. I was the only woman always. I teamed up with another male worker. He taught me how to drive this complex machine. And uh, I waited for an opportunity. And then one day, the tractor was there. And I ran to it. And I, I did the task. And I remember shivering and kind of thinking that if I would fail, maybe I could never do this task again. And uh, it worked out. And the day after, I was allocated this task. I was like, Hatla, you go and drive this tractor now. Because I had kind of shown that it was possible. And there are two lessons here that I use a lot when I face these challenges. One is that you need to make allies, right? And that both applies to, to women, but also to men. You know, you need to team up with partners uh, that can help you. And then the other thing is that when you face uh, these boundaries, these glass ceilings, you have to remember that it's going to be uncomfortable to ch try to change something. It's going to feel, you're going to be scared. Yeah. And um, I try when I'm you know, d g facing things like this in my career to think about that 14-year-old girl that stole the tractor, sort of, <laughs> uh, and, and, and I use that courage as a driver. Uh, to do the things, even today. So when you were 14, did, did you have a role model? What was your motivation to stand up and fight? Oh, you know, we're so lucky in Iceland. We, we, you know, I grew up with having uh, a female president. Yes, Vigdís Vimbaudóttir, who was the first uh, democrat democratically elected female president in the world. And, you know, she was an inspiration to all women. And then we had a female mayor in the city of Reykjavik. We had like one of the television hosts was uh, this incredible woman. So a lot of role models um, uh, around us to, to inspire. And I think that has mattered a lot for women in Iceland. Because Japan does not have a female prime minister yet. So it's, it's a big impact because that will discourage the young girls in Japan. So I think it's very important to have a women leader in important positions, mm -hmm. yeah. I agree, because you're, sor you're sort of mirroring your future yes, uh -huh. always in, mm -hmm. you know, and, and seeing the, the possibilities, uh, you know, through the eyes of society. And if you see that it's possible to be in any role as you could uh, when I was growing up, um, uh, that's an encouragement that anything is possible. Yes. Thank you for your experience. Thank you so much. OK, Christina, how about you? Any personal experience when you confronted the glass ceiling in the STEM fields? Uh, yeah, well, um, I think here that the main obstacle has been my own uh, naivety and believing that if I do good work and good research, that is enough to advance uh, in the career and make an impact uh, on the world and so on. But very early on i noticed that actually this uh, it's even though it is a prerequisite uh, in uh, science uh, it's uh, not enough you have to also understand the context and uh, our, the the sort of relation in which uh, we conduct uh, our our work how to navigate I remember when I was a, a student, uh, um, it's usually very difficult uh, to, to go against your su uh, supervisor's ideas. And uh, often it is actually more beneficial to understand what is the context and, and the uh, practices uh, in the scientific field. But you also uh, have to believe in your own uh, ideas. Um, when I was working uh, as an undergraduate, I um, sort of encountered a particular type of hypothesis uh, of uh, computational linguistics. And uh, um, these uh, were not exactly supported uh, in the uh, um, current uh, sort of um, environment. And um, uh, my thesis was uh, very badly um, sort of um, valued, and I was very disappointed uh, and, of course, a little bit uh, depressed as well. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, there were some really brilliant uh, colleagues, uh, uh, females, who pointed out that it's not necessarily your own fault. It is something which is a kind of a power violation against the young female students. And what you need to do is to believe in your own goals, which is important in making making um, our uh, science. And I think the important thing in uh, that time in Finland, and maybe even nowadays, is that we are assuming that uh, gender equality is uh, somehow uh, given. It is uh, something which he, we have uh, been uh, uh, assuming because uh, Finland is the first country to give uh, sort of parliamentary rights to women, second in the whole world. Uh, and we continue to live in a country where these equal opportunities are still uh, very much a prominence. But there is some, some kind of a subtle uh, inequality aspects uh, related to decision making and power management and so on. And these kind of a hidden stereotypes seem to me uh, to be uh, one of the, the biggest uh, um, issues in uh, uh, getting sort of full uh, power over uh, female uh, sort of or opportunities. Um, when I then uh, actually went uh, to do my PhD at the University of Manchester in the uh, UK, I was uh, introduced to very self-confident women in the corporate mailing list, and it opened me to a whole uh, new world uh, where it was uh, important uh, to actually, what I said already earlier, to see the power of uh, our uh, community and uh, support. So there is, uh, for instance, uh, one of the very first uh, electronic mailing list, which was called uh, uh, Sisters, um, already established about uh, 87. And uh, um, that uh, was a uh, very good support uh, to see um, and to discuss uh, about the similar uh, issues that other people all around the world have experienced. There was something called uh, Grace Hopper, our uh, orator, who was uh, um, uh, one of the, the first uh, uh, programmers. Uh, she actually invented uh, that programming language, and that gave uh, um, kind of uh, uh, belief that yes, that is a role model um, that uh, you can uh, follow. So I uh, think uh, through this type of uh, excellent and brilliant colleagues, uh, um, it is uh, possible uh, to uh, build up uh, uh, your uh, um, kind of self-confidence and uh, also see that uh, it is not only uh, you alone, but there is this potential uh, in um, each and everyone finding their own way and working to work together uh, towards uh, some better, better world. Uh, Christina, thank you. Uh, I think you made a good point. Um, so I have an impression that in the STEM field, um, what matters is scientific facts. So always the scientific facts wins. So even so, why is there a gender gap still in the scientific field, even though there's the scientific fact always wins? That's uh, is a, is a good uh, good question, and uh, I think it it goes to this thing that. Uh, um, we are not just working um, with the scientific facts, uh, but there are a lot of different hidden uh, power relations, uh, different aspects uh, that actually um, relate to how we make decisions, uh, um, how um, certain positions are decided, uh, um, um, certain uh, fellowships are uh, are, are distributed, uh, projects are funded, etc. And uh, it's uh, in these kind of committees where we would actually need uh, um, enough uh, uh, women uh, to take part uh, uh, in the decision uh, making and uh, also um, kind of support uh, uh, this uh, um, sort of uh, maybe less known, but uh, but uh, very promising uh, female colleagues uh, to, to get uh, through the glass ceiling. 
Hello, do you have something to comment? Because in the scientific field, there is still discrimination and stereotypes, which is not scientific, is coming in. Do you well, I think, you know, to Christina's point, um, of course you have all these different relationships that are built over time. You may have male colleagues that study together, you know, work together for a longer time, so they have stronger relationships and networks than maybe women that are coming in, coming in later on. So there are all these ca hidden things uh. that must be addressed as well mm -hmm. uh, and can make it more difficult to kind of break the glass ceiling, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, because these relationship, uh, take, it takes time to build them and, and you have to um, uh, be able to team up with allies to actually get from A to B. So it's hidden. I think these things are, are, are more hidden because these are, you know, relationships between people. Right. You uh -huh. know, it's mm -hmm. people that m may have a group of men that has done their PhD together ah. and they're then working together for 20 years on a research project. So it's difficult to kind of enter that field. Uh, you're not, you're not in an equal... Yeah, they're like buddies and unofficial connections. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's not an equal playing okay, field, even yeah. though the facts that you were mentioning <laughs> to Christina <laughs> yes. uh -huh. are, are, are right or even better. So it's, it's these dynamics that come into play as well. Mm, that's a good point, thank you. So Hiromi, uh, could you share us your experience when facing yes, the glass Yes, thank you so much. Yes. So uh, related to this discussion, so I feel uh, there is a big uh, discrimination, uh, ability discrimination is uh, there. Uh, in our society, especially uh, in Japan. And the, the first uh, glass ceiling I met uh, 20 years ago uh, when I was a high school student. And I was very interested in physics because I hope to know why this university uh, universe is occurred. And so I'm very interested in physics field. And But uh, my, my parents and teachers and uh, my friends also uh, disagree uh, the well, choice of the physics uh, because the physics uh, image is very, very masculine. And only the genius student go to physics field. And uh, so I was um, maybe good at mathematics, but uh, you don't go to, you, you should not go to um, uh, physics field. Uh, all of them, they saw, they said to me. So that was a very big uh, uh, experience for me, but the, so but enter to university. Uh, it's good uh, field for me, and the, so I I joined the international group of the physics field, and the, it is very uh, friendly and it's a very good uh, environment. But uh, uh, I pointed out our uh, facility, like a uh, restroom or some something bathroom, or so there are very very few <laughs> place, and that was a very big problem at that time. Uh, so Hiromi wrote an interesting book in Japanese, I read it, it's about the women in STEM field and you mentioned that a lot of Japanese girls when they're in elementary schools or junior high school they are good at mathematics, even top in the uh, global level, but when they're about to enter a high school or university their parents or teachers discourage them to go to the STEM field or study further. Could you share that, elaborate on that? Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we call it mass stereotype. And uh, so in Japan, mass st stereotype is very, very strong. And the uh, society, a uh, public thinks only male, uh, male student can do mathematics. And uh, of course, it's not true, but the uh, society thinks so. And uh, also, girls student uh, think, uh, think so like that. And that was a very that is very big problem in Japan, and uh, we have to uh, educate not only girls but also boys and the parents and also society. I think. Hutler, mm -hmm. could you share your experience in Iceland about education? Because um, I've interviewed uh, Japanese parents who don't want their daughters to go to the STEM field, and they're not being mean because it's the opposite. They want to be nice, and they don't want their daughters to feel bad when they enter a career. So it's a very complex problem. So what's it like in Iceland or Nordic countries? Well, if I can speak, I used to um, work at the Reykjavik University that is uh, very much focused on, on t uh, technology, computer science and so forth. Um, and I wouldn't say it was necessarily uh, something brought from home, but I would say that it was, you know, it w computer science, for instance, was more considered something for boys. It was not maybe as socially acceptable that girls were playing computer games as, as boys. So it's, it's kind of a, 
uh, bias uh, there. But what the university did uh, was to have special programs mm. to recruit women into computer science to try to change that mindset mm. because it's all about changing how people view uh, these things. Mm. And if I think about, I've been once uh, before uh, to Japan and it was almost 20 years ago mm -hmm. and I had a chance to visit this incredible place called uh, Sony Future Labs. Mm -hmm. And I, what I keep thinking back to is if we could have these incredible companies that are here in Japan, for an instance, to, to help make it cool for girls to be in science and tech, if, if that it could be a, a part of their journey, that would really, you know, uh, uh, could play a role in, in bringing women in if these big tech giants would take uh, initiative. Uh, and I guess then the question is, you know, how do you do that? Yes. How do you make it a, a CEO's goal mm -hmm. to actually, uh, you know, not only look at uh, revenues, <laughs> but also to look at uh, gender equality as a part of your uh, return on investment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can we do that? A good question. Um, well, I've looked at some research uh, in this field and I saw one that said that uh, of the Fortune 500 companies, uh, the one that have more diversity in management had over 30% higher return on equity. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a study, mm -hmm. but such arguments you know, that it actually pays off mm -hmm. recruiting women, I think are powerful for CEOs mm -hmm. to have. Thank you. Christina, uh, could you uh, comment on the, the importance of education? Yes, uh, sure. I, I think that this is uh, one of the, the very important um, aspects. Uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, what I said, that we need to bring awareness of these uh, these uh, issues uh, uh, on very early on. Um, there are um, actually uh, uh, very good different networks, at least in, in the Helsinki University, where they um, actually try to um, encourage uh, um, um, young uh, children in general um, to to work on um, STEM uh, issues, especially encourage uh, um, young girls. And um, one of the things uh, is using uh, robots and uh, robot interaction. So uh, trying to to see how engineering works uh, from the very beginning, building these little gadgets, uh, making them. Uh, uh, talk and uh, and so on and uh, i think this type of um, education from the very um, beginning is uh, important uh, but um, i also like to to say that um, maybe we still need to also uh, think about uh, uh, different uh, kind of uh, possibilities and opportunities so um I just recently evaluated um, a particular AI program, AI in engineering, and um, there um, actually it turned out that there was only 50% of the doctoral students were female. Um, but uh, we distinguished uh, or dis discussed a lot uh, about uh, this issue, and it turned out that maybe. Um, there are different goals and different aspects uh, that people value um, after the, the first uh, degree, so that we need to provide opportunities. Uh, not all students and not all female want to go straight uh, to their pipeline where they get uh, a doctoral degree and they get uh, a scientific uh, uh, merits but there are also these aspects in other uh, um, sort of parts of the life which are important um, having um, family having some experience on other aspects uh, than than science and maybe that is a very important to to be able to distinguish um, the um, diversity um, of people and what they want to do. So um, instead of just uh, wanting to have, uh, uh, say, more women in STEM, we may uh, want to sort of support uh, um, the possibilities, how you find your uh, goal and your uh, 
um, kind of place in the world where these STEM issues are also important. And if you feel that you want to go towards that kind of aspects, that kind of science as your life's passion, we should get some more support for that. But also, if you are interested in more on the communicating with uh, with um, uh, technological gadgets that's also uh, possible uh, we need to have this kind of uh, um, differences uh, and support uh, the uh, different uh, alternatives that we can uh, thank you uh, christina i want to ask you about ai um about chat gpt have you used chat gpt do you do you think he or she understands diversity or is it biased Oh, uh, ChatGPT is is very biased, biased. and uh, I must say, <laughs> and uh, I must say that uh, uh, in this particular conference, I'm uh, currently here in uh, in uh, Sapporo. Uh, we have uh, very much uh, studied uh, our, uh, ChatGPT, uh, these large language models, uh, and how they are biased. What we can do in order to build more trustworthy and uh, sort of um, reliable uh, systems. The, the problem with uh, very simple um, ChatGPT type uh, interactions is that often they are called something like uh, parrots. They, they are just uh, repeating what uh, is in this large knowledge base or, or database uh, they take uh, their they words uh, from, uh, but uh, the uh, real understanding, uh, emotions, uh, reasons, uh, what's uh, what's uh, real in in the world uh, uh, what is uh, true that is still something that uh, we need to to uh, do uh, more, more more work and there is a lot of active work in in trying to to, to see in yeah. that uh, direction <laughs> i like to hear hiromi's comments because shouldn't ai should be better than human beings why is it still biased yes uh, of course uh, the Internet uh, uh, information is uh, most of them, <laughs> not most of them, but uh, many information is biased. Oh. And so uh, ChatGPT learn from internet, and uh, that's a very big reason why uh, ChatGPT is biased. And so uh, for that, uh, the company uh, have to care about that kind of bias issues. But uh, in, in Japan, uh, the policy is now making and uh, there are many, many uh, biases and problems inside our, our society. And related to uh, Christina's comments, uh, she mentioned about the value also. And I think so in Japan, our uh, main uh, issue is the common value for the gender issue is not yet concreted. So that's, that is a very big problem in Japan, I think. And uh, so especially a sense of gender role is very, very strong in Japan. And uh, we found in our research and and the, uh, the relation between the uh, gender role issues and also higher education issue is very, very connected. And in Tokyo area, it's a very good at a uh, sense of gender role. And But the, uh, the other side, uh, like in Kyushu area, so that kind of uh, far from Tokyo area is a very, very strong sense of gender role. And so in that, that kind of area, so girls could not uh, go to university, not only STEM, but also all the fields. So it is very, very big uh, common problem in Japan, I think. How can we get rid of the bias, especially in Japan? Mm, only education, I think. So I also, <laughs> I also uh, educated a graduate student in STEM field. And but the, uh, recently in Japan, uh, high school teachers started some kind of gender education. Uh, so I'm very interested in uh, the boys' school in Japan. Not only girls' school, but the only boys' group uh, in high school is uh, already uh, there are some. Uh, boys' schools, and uh, their teacher studies some kind of gender uh, education. So it, it, it is very interesting because my university, <laughs> uh, more than maybe half of our students came from boys' 
schools. So that's the very big, big issues. And the masculine, our, our boys group is a very big issue in our university. So we have to change. Of course, uh, we also uh, educate students, but the, uh, we need uh, more younger education is uh, very in important, we think. Mm. Are there boys only high schools in Iceland or fin Finland? No, not high schools, no. Okay. <laughs> you, yeah, you have an, uh, in younger age, you have a school, a school, ah, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, usually mixed. But I, I think this is an, such an interesting uh, point about how you, you know, how do you change perspectives of, of boys and that become men and, and how you need to make sure that we are also bringing them into yeah. the gender equality dialogue. Uh, which is critical for the understanding if we really want to make the change. Um, so I think that's going to be one of the, the big challenges. We look at gender equality worldwide. It has an impact on, you know, it has an impact in the workplace. And of course, it has an impact at home as well. What flexibility do you have uh, to pursue your career, to take care of your kids and so forth? It, it kind of all goes hand in hand. This is a question for Hiromi. So I agree that we should have boys and men uh, included in the discussion, but in Japan there's kind of a backlash and some people think that uh, gender equality is a very Western thing and it's, all, it's a Nordic thing and we Japanese have a different tradition. How can we overcome such stereotypes? Uh, it's very, very difficult yeah. things and we cannot yet uh, conclude, uh, include uh, all of them, but the, uh, but uh, it is important to uh, collaborate with male professors also. And uh, we organized the uh, lecture, uh, both female and male uh, professors. And uh, so boys students uh, can hear uh, male professor at first. <laughs> and <laughs> they can hear uh, my voice also. And uh, so that kind of uh, collaboration is very important with things, but the backlash is very strong in Japan. So it is, I'm worried about it also. Yes. Mm. Uh, Christina, how about, is there a backlash in the Nordic countries from men about gender equality? Um, I think um, there, uh, there is, um, as I said, some kind of, um, um, I may be a bit too strong by saying, but I guess there's a bit like illusion that uh, we, we have uh, uh, equality, even though there are these uh, hidden aspects uh, which are related to how the decisions uh, are, are made uh, and um, um, how the uh, possibilities uh, are kind of supported and provided to uh, uh, young children and, uh, and students. Um, it seems to me that, uh, that uh, um, one thing that we could uh, do, I um, think my colleagues already mentioned, that uh, um, we may um, actually do things together uh, with uh, men because uh, our, these uh, equal opportunities would also benefit uh, um, uh, those uh, uh, male colleagues uh, who may not be so interested in STEM but may actually want to go to some uh, prototypical female areas uh, like uh, um, care health uh, and and caretaking uh, areas so um, um, maybe one of the the things that uh, would be useful is to think uh, why these opportunities also uh, not only one time in in a life but uh, thinking of uh, um, kind of continuous education, um, opportunities that we can take also uh, when we uh, get older, so that life is not only a pipeline where you need to uh, select and make your choices, but it is possible also to, to um, for instance, come back to university at the later time uh, to do your uh, doctoral students. I think in Japanese there is some something called uh, uh, shakai jin hakase, uh, yes, term, shakai jin hakase. Uh, which refers to this kind of uh, possibilities and where especially women might, might uh, benefit, but I guess uh, also uh, in, in general that would be a, a good uh, uh, direction. 
Uh, and uh, in uh, uh, Finland, uh, this kind of a continuous uh, um, uh, education uh, which uh, continues through your whole uh, life, I think that uh, has been uh, uh, very much uh, uh, supported as well. Hiromi, do you agree that university can take an uh, important role in uh, achieving gender equality? Uh, uh, yes, of yeah. course, mm -hmm. uh, because the, uh, especially STEM field, so as you know, the uh, number of the researchers and also uh, technician, um, all of them is very low ratio. And the uh, trust we have to change, and the now uh, we, are, uh, we, we hope to hire many, many professors as a role model. But the, so that's the balance of the uh, occasion because the uh, if we get a new professors of female and the, so male professor is uh, maybe young uh, researchers are uh, uh, lost some kind of a pause and so that kind of balance is very very difficult and the, that's the one of the reason of the backlash I think and, mm, but of course we have to change at first and the, mm, we are now uh, struggling that issues do you get any negative feedback from young male? Uh, academias uh, yes of, of course losing every time okay. yes every time but the, i'm i'm uh, we are very uh, care about it and the, so of course a uh, very good uh, young researcher should be hired and the, so uh, that kind of opportunity uh, should be uh, prepared all of them but the, so uh, now uh, we are very hurried to increasing the number of the female professors and the, so it's the uh, that kind of difficult uh, timing mm. So uh, from now on, I want to talk about uh, solutions. So uh, before that, uh, could you someone uh, give us some comments about why is it important to achieve uh, gender equality in the STEM fields? What kind of impact would it give to the society? Anyone? Yeah, you can hazard, yeah. Well, I can start and just referring yeah. to my colleagues here on the okay. left. I mean, you're, we're talking about uh, technologies that mm -hmm. are advancing very quickly and will change our world. Uh, and it's extremely important, you know, speaking about biases mm -hmm. of how the technology involves and whom it will serve and all of these things mm -hmm. to actually make sure that we have women engaged in the decision making. Mm -hmm. And I think th they both made some great comments about how important it is to have role models, yeah. both for women and for, m for young men mm -hmm. that are entering the field, because if, if young uh, researchers, male researchers, work with more senior female uh, professors. Mm -hmm. That completely changes uh, kind of the perspective when they start to hire as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, making sure that we are engaging women now, particularly in these fast changing fields like uh, AI, uh, energy transition yes. is another one, mm -hmm. um, is critical. Uh, it's critical for the future and, and maybe the most important point is that, you know, if we don't do it, we w will not see the impact in the next two years, mm -hmm. but we will be sitting here in, in 20 years, you know, thinking about how we manage to get these things wrong. Christina, Hiromi, do you have any, uh, Christina, yeah. Well, I, I can full, just uh, fully fully agree. I, I think uh, society needs all talented individuals, uh, yeah. and uh, that uh, is very important. That uh, women have amazing potential and uh, skills, and uh, um, this kind of um, um, understanding of also uh, certain type of relations uh, and uh, how to uh, sort of present uh, things, uh, taking uh, uh, the team in, into account. Uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, what uh, my colleagues were, were already uh, talking about. Uh, and I think it is, uh, it is uh, extremely uh, important uh, that uh, we can uh, have uh, all the resources, uh, all the skillful and talented people to bring the better world, especially in this kind of times that we are living when there are very sort of uh, worrying news are coming all over. We, we need to, to build uh, uh, this type of uh, community and uh, um, sort of uh, use, uh, use uh, everyone has a role to, to play. <laughs> Yes, everyone should be on the team, on the board, and no one should be left behind because we are in such such a difficult times. I agree with you. Hiromi, do you have any? Yes. Uh, I also uh, agree with all of you. 
And in Japan, uh, this is a very, very aging society. And so our government needs new uh, human resources. But, uh, but I think uh, basically uh, it is very important for our human rights uh, because the only guards cannot go to STEM. It's, it's the uh, problem with the human rights, I think. So at first, uh, we have to uh, increase the uh, gender equality sense in our society and uh, we have to increase at, at the same time we have to increase the number of the STEM field researchers and students also and uh, so that's the uh, very big challenge in, in Japan I think. Okay so uh, before going to the q and I'd like to ask each panelist the solution so we now understand that we should break the glass ceiling but what action can we take from tomorrow or t even today to in order to achieve our goals. Yeah, so I will start with Hiromi. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. So uh, at first, uh, I, I feel uh, education is the very key point of our society. And uh, we have to change the sense of gender equality, uh, gender role. And uh, so in Japan, it is very, very difficult to change him uh, until now. But the, it's the timing because the, our government also hope to change him. And uh, so uh, many companies are increasing the number of the higher position female uh, staff. And it is very, very good timing. And the, from now, uh, we can change the, our society. And I believe it. And uh, we have to continue to uh, encourage girls also. Yes, I agree. Christina, how about you? Solution? Um, yes, I uh, I fully agree. I think uh, there are issues uh, related to uh, legislation and uh, important uh, aspects uh, to actually make it clear that uh, that is a goal of a society. I think also in work situations, uh, um, I, uh, I'd like to, to say that one of the things we discussed uh, um, earlier was about uh, um, how to um, uh, take care of your family and, uh, and children. And uh, as long as uh, we have uh, laws and attitudes uh, which uh, put uh, all the responsibility on women, this will not change. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, in uh, in Finland just a couple of years or two years ago, uh, there was a, a new law which uh, uh, provided opportunities uh, for both parents uh, to take a leave and uh, actually uh, um, required uh, that uh, the benefits uh, are uh, uh, financially and uh, um, otherwise uh, equal for both uh, mothers and fathers, so both parents, uh, and uh, that was made and uh, to uh, support uh, um, the child raising and building relations uh, between uh, both uh, parents uh, and uh, their children. And maybe uh, initiatives uh, where this type of uh, uh, issues are put forward uh, uh, and uh, uh, taken to to the level of uh, uh, sort of general uh, legislation are important. But I also would like to to say one more thing, uh, which is the, that uh, when we then talk about individuals, uh, we are all uh, human beings. Uh, I would uh, like to put forward something called PDA. Uh, this is not your personal digital uh, assistant uh, <laughs> or public uh, display of uh, affection, but uh, it is uh, related to passion, determination, and adaptation. And I think it's important that we have a passion or belief uh, in our goals, what we want to go. There is a target, uh, uh, what we uh, want our abilities to, to sort of uh, use it, to reach it, and uh, get uh, kind of gives us some satisfaction. We need to be some determined uh, determination to go through different obstacles and uh, uh, difficulties and uh, get uh, to that uh, goal. But also we need uh, this kind of adaptab adaptability. So not just going straight to something and arguing, but also seeing what what is is it to be in a flexible way? Uh, how we can best uh, change and to get these things um, done and to get to our original goal, 
or if it turns out that we have been somehow going a wrong direction, maybe we have also right uh, to correct uh, ourselves and uh, and uh, see if uh, some other solution actually works better. So PDA. <laughs> <laughs> PDA. Oh, Christina, it's, it was interesting to learn about the law because um, when we uh, see the gender gap index of the world gender gap index, Japan is always ranked very low. And of course, Finland and Iceland is very ranked high every year. But I learned from you that even Finland or Iceland is still an ongoing process to conquer the gender equality. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes, and uh, I, I guess that's what we spoke uh, earlier on, uh, that uh, um, it is a very slow process uh, mm. to uh, get the awareness uh, and, and uh, attitudes uh, uh, more positive than uh, okay. But it helps uh, if there are certain some structures in society mm. that actually support and uh, want to take us towards uh, this kind of equality. Wonderful, thank you. So, Hatner, about the solution, yeah. Yes, um, a lot of things to think about and great comments from yes. the, uh, my colleagues. I will echo uh, uh, what you said about education and maybe combining, you know, making sure that we are, we have top-down policies. So it's not only the academics struggling to make a change, but it's actually they can refer to a university goal mm -hmm. or a company goal or, or uh, a legal framework adopted by the government to have something to, to uh, kind of support you in that journey. And then I will have to echo what Christina said about the uh, paternity leave. We've seen in Iceland that it's actually, you know, uh, it's, it's created the connection that she mentioned. So it's actually creating a lot of bonds between fathers and children that then live on. But guess what? It's also making it less risky to hire women. Because if both women and men are taking paternity, maternity and paternity leave, you know, it suddenly becomes an equal risk to hire a young scientist that is a female or uh, a young one that is a male. And I think that's important. And maybe to add to that, because we're speaking about maternity and paternity leave, I think as an action point, an additional one, we should remember that you know, a lot of these are, are norms that, you know, grow with us from the very beginning. Yes. So if we can take it as an action point and maybe start practicing tomorrow, since it is the International <laughs> Women's Day, to just think about raising our boys and girls. Yes. You know, what is the language that we use? What are the roles uh, that we give them in the house and so forth? That will also help us uh, change direction over time. I agree because I took a paternity leave for four months and my son saw me in the kitchen cleaning the room. So that kind of changed his mindset. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I have some time for a question, maybe from the floor or even from online. Uh, could you raise your hand and maybe introduce yourself? I'm sure you have a lot of tons of questions to ask. It's a good opportunity. So come on. You have to ask questions. We, okay. The person, the gentleman right here with the uh, gray jacket. I think there's a microphone, okay. Uh, thank you for and the, the panelists and the, and the team and the team. I'm Hiro and I'm uh, from and, uh, Japan, but and, uh, I'm usually and, uh, from and, uh, France. Uh, my profession is uh, cooking chef and uh, French time and uh, for and, uh, 35 years. Uh, now and, uh, in Japan, and, uh, we were working at the supporting to and uh, for John uh, 2025 uh, and uh, for EU and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, United Nations and, uh, and uh, Japan and, uh, government and uh, team. So I have and, uh, one question and uh, for the, uh, different theme and gender and the uh, woman and the uh, man and uh, for I think for and uh, for and uh, if and uh, uh, and uh, children and the uh, student and uh, for the uh, don't and uh, go and uh, to and uh, school and uh, uh, Japanese name and around uh, the uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, 
Tony Obio and and the and the big and the and the fake and for uh, looking for and for the don't understand and the and the different but and for and the way and the and the and the left and the two and the and the gender left and I think for and the way they have and the and the say and the for gender because and for and the uh, Finland and, and uh, Norway and uh, North and uh, European people and uh, from the and, uh, happy and uh, the and, uh, happiness and uh, from the future and uh, I think for under uh, Japan and under uh, for Shete and uh, for uh, working and a uh, long long time and from the don't uh, on the stop and uh, don't and a uh, holiday uh, yeah because and for uh, our future future and uh, from the uh, uh, Futoko and the children and the supporting and for and the I say and the gender and the for and the panelist and the for the Toko and the people and the support and the for and the and the you and the thinking of the two and the something too. Thank so, you. so let me uh, clarify. So you're asking about the gender equality and the happiness uh, yeah, of yeah. the connection between? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Who, do you, who do you want to, do you want to answer from each panelist? Uh, okay. Four people. Okay. And Futoko is a Japanese term that there are uh, many children in Japan who don't want to go to Japan or to, to the school or who choose not to go to school. And it's a social problem or maybe some people say it's not a problem because it's their own choice. Yes. Okay. So uh, happiness and gender equality. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for the excellent question to, to start with. I don't have the statistics in my hat, but uh, if we look at, for instance, some countries that score quite high in gender equality, the, the, the World Economic Forum's list, for an example, what they also have in common uh, is to rank relatively high as well on the happiness okay. index. I'm just going to make <laughs> the exception <laughs> that there's a correlation there. <laughs> no, but I think in the bottom line probably is that, you know, if more people of, of all genders can thrive and pursue their dreams, make, you know, the most of their talents, that goes hand in hand with individual uh, happiness mm. and hopefully contributing to society's happiness as well. So I'm going to be brave and say, yes, there's a strong <laughs> correlation. <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Christina, how about you? Well, I, I also agree. I, I think uh, happiness uh, um, comes uh, from you being able to fulfill your, your own uh, um, sort of a purpose. Uh, you are, as I said, uh, you are sort of passionate something, you are sort of, you believe something which is important uh, for you. And if you um, live uh, in a um, society where you get support uh, to, to get uh, through, to, to live your, your dreams, uh, that uh, actually gives you positive energy back uh, and uh, gives you um, happiness. And the more you are happy yourself, that also kind of grows and and shines uh, uh, around you. So I agree. <laughs> it's a correlation. Okay. Hiromi san. Yes. Yes. Uh, I also think that there are very uh, strong correlation between both of them, and the, so we Japanese are started to notice about the well-being is very important, and the, our society uh, our people work very very hard, as as he said, <laughs> and the uh, Japanese school is a little bit competitive. It's, yeah. So it means that uh, students have to uh, study very hard, and the, so in East Asia country, not only Japan but also Korea is very, very strong uh, competition situation, and also Chinese also very strong high, high competition to go to university. So it means the children's well-being is not so good mm -hmm. in these countries. So it is a very, very big problem. But the, uh, I think it's related to also uh, STEM issues, and the, so we have to care about the uh, children's well-being, as I said. I think. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful question. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Uh, Yes. Oh, there is a microphone, so if you, you can ask in Nihongo demo I I believe that uh, female science or mathematics teachers are very good role models for girls. 
But in Japan, there are, there are not so many female science or mathematics teachers, uh, starting from junior, uh -huh, junior high school and high school. And also researchers in science and physics are very, uh, there are not so many. But how about you in Nordic countries? Uh, I'd like to know the situation of your countries. Great question. Hannah, you first. Um, uh, excellent question. So, again, not basing this on any particular statistics, but just on my experience working in a, in a tech university, uh, it's definitely been growing the ratio of uh, female teachers in the, this field. And I think you're right. I think it really uh, makes a difference uh, in terms of the role model issue that we spoke about. And it also makes a difference not only for, you know, that you want to pursue that particular career, but it also makes a difference in the sense that maybe you can watch uh, your professor, you know, have children and you can see that yeah. it's possible to, to have not only the education and the career, but also kind of the family life. And if you have a role model in the, these fields that has also been able to do these different things, then maybe that field even becomes more appealing to you because you don't feel like you need to risk other things by choosing uh, that path. Christina, do you have any comments? Um, well, um, again, I, I think uh, that uh, uh, role models uh, are uh, um, often very close to, to us uh, so that uh, we look up uh, maybe our, uh, our, our mother, grandmother, aunts, uh, um, uh, school teachers, uh, and uh, also uh, all other women that uh, we can see uh, being in, in sort of positions uh, where they can actually speak and show how these different uh, um, aspects of life uh, can be successfully uh, combined uh, and um, uh, so already mentioned the very beginning some of the very important uh, aspects are are these uh, um, already kind of a pioneering um, uh, colleagues uh, uh, who were through the, the times uh, when it was uh, very difficult uh, for them to go through and they they did actually break the glass ceiling. Uh, that uh, is uh, always uh, very um, uh, inspirational uh, even uh, today. Hiromi, do you have any comments? Yes, uh, as she said, uh, uh, yes, uh, Japan, in Japanese, junior high school science and mathematics teacher is very low ratio, and the, so increasing the number of the teacher is very, very important, I think. And the, so especially junior high school, uh, Japanese girls started to dislike math and sciences, and so it's a very important timing. And the, at that time, uh, 13 or 14 years uh, girls is very, very difficult timing. They are changing, and they, they care about boys and fashion and that kind of thing. And the many Japanese girls, uh, science is not cool. But that's not truth. So we have to uh, <laughs> uh, encourage them, and we have to say science and technology is very, very cool things. <laughs> and the, so we have to show like that. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? OK, please. Hello. So um, I'm mixed Japanese and Swedish. So I grew up at a home with a Japanese mother and a Swedish father. And so I've kind of seen both sides in terms of how like education is set up and attitudes towards higher education. And I was interested in what Hiromi-san said about um, competitiveness and the competitiveness in university admissions where um, you have to you know, study for the Juken and you have to get a, the top grades and it's, you, it's like a blind thing. Whereas in Sweden, I, from what I've seen at least, it's more, um, relaxed attitudes towards university admissions and you kind of go wherever and then there's not really like a consensus as much as in Japan about elite schools and trying to get into the best schools. So how do you think that the role of university admissions plays into this gender inequality conversation and the impact of that in gender inequality in the STEM fields? Yeah, great question. Do you 
want to start. It's a great, excellent question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question. And uh, it's, it's, it is very difficult to answer because I'm a professor at the university. <laughs> I, have, I, I couldn't say about the examination itself. But the, uh, some university in Japan started the uh, gender quota for the uh, STEM department. So it's, it is very discussion now. And uh, I'm not so agree that kind of a uh, solution uh, because the, it looks a uh, university professor say uh, gen, uh, girls don't have ability like that. I, I, it can see like that. So gender quality, uh, gender quota for the department. So uh, uh, like uh, Toko Daititek started uh, uh, of uh, uh, several uh, students, uh, only the uh, just the interview uh, to go to enter the engineering department, and it's not uh, usual in Japan because the Japan's uh, examination is only uh, just the score, uh, very very strictly. And of course, our university have the another uh, admission, uh, only interview or the uh, score of the high school. And the, so it's uh, the, uh, we make the different type of uh, uh, admission, but the, it's not depends on gender. So it is, I think, very important. So we believe girls have very big ability. And we we have to believe it at first. We, I think so. So, but the, so our Japanese university uh, already we have struggled very very long time, uh, forty years or so. Also, uh, many professors are uh, very tired for it. <laughs> and the, so it's very easy solution to make the post for a girls student. Uh, so uh, now uh, several uh, very famous universities studied it. But uh, I don't think it's not the solution, but uh, we have to encourage girls and uh, uh, continue to uh, encourage uh, activity like that, I think. Alden, do you want to comment? Do you want to comment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, fantastic question, and, and I think you're right. I think there's much more flexibility if you look at the Nordic countries in terms of the number of paths that you can go. And I think it's a big responsibility of you know, admissions, evaluations, to make sure that you're actually not only counting for the great, but what does the kind of holistic picture look like? What types of experiences do you have? Or how do hobbies even and, and things like that uh, come into uh, play? I will say, if I turn it around, because I've, I've worked uh, in the US in, in uh, uh, this uh, competitive environment, and I will say that it's very big relief in many ways to uh, raise a family and kind of pursue career when you have access to the Nordic system. Uh, because uh, in the US, for an example, you have these barriers like extremely high health care uh, and uh, much more uh, kind of stereotypical environment and, and competitiveness. So whether you're speaking about this from the angle of being a student entering or actually being a female professor, uh, 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 raising children and, and having family, uh, it's ex extremely important to look at more things than just uh, ratings and grades and, and so forth. Hotler, you went to Harvard, and I'm sure Harvard is very competitive. What's it like in Harvard? Is it different from the, yeah? Well, I, it's, it's uh, demanding and, 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 and so forth. But I will say that, you know, I have two girls. Uh, one is four and the other one is, is turning 12. And um, it's, it's the challenge, the biggest challenge of being in a competitive environment like uh, at Harvard is the fact that you need to have access to health uh, care that is really costly in the US, and you need to have access to childcare. And that is, these are barriers. Like you really need to have access to good childcare, babysitting, all these things, if you're supposed to thrive in that competitive environment. So I would say, you know, making sure, you know, whether it's in Japan or in, or in any country in the world or in Iceland, uh, the, the, the key aspect for to be able to thrive and pursue your dreams in a competitive environment um, if you want to have family and so forth is to have access to childcare and not only access to it but at affordable rates 
So that's one uh, uh, lesson that I very much enjoy from Iceland, is to, to now have access to these uh, type of support systems. Christine, I saw you nodding. Uh, any comments? <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, um, what I would like to, to say is, is that uh, um, in, in Japan, it seems to me that uh, there is a, a still kind of a one path. Uh, and uh, if you go, for instance, to university, you are supposed to, to do uh, things in a certain order and in a certain number of years, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, competitiveness as such, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because it can also be a motivating thing to to uh, help you to to um, achieve uh, better results when you see that others are doing well so you can actually get motivation you can also do uh, that uh, that same thing um, but one thing that I'd like to mention is also that uh, we perhaps need to to think uh, more of uh, different type of measures for evaluation so um, we were talking about how you get to, to university through interviews and certain kind of, of points, uh, but um, uh, maybe um, there are uh, other um, aspects as, as well in the um, measurement of how well you do. And uh, those other um, aspects uh, like uh, producing some uh, particular practical things, uh, being creative, uh, um, uh, providing uh, certain Certain kind of uh, uh, support uh, to uh, community, uh, they can also be very valuable things, which uh, should be um, uh, valued uh, um, as uh, um, sort of results of uh, uh, your skills and uh, uh, potential. So um, maybe the structure of the studies and the way how we evaluate that uh, um, results is also important uh, in order to acknowledge the variety and diversity uh, through which uh, we want to, to go through, go through uh, this uh, uh, career path that uh, uh, we aim uh, to, to go through. Okay, uh, do we have some time for one question where finished? Okay, okay. Uh, oh, so one quick question, yes, okay. Quick, okay. Thank you very much for your time and uh, very intriguing and inspiring uh, discussion. I'm Fuiko Nilsson. I'm from uh, Spring, which is the organization of political lobbying and advocacy uh, initiative in Japan. Consists of uh, sexual violence survivors and supporters. We are uh, trying to make Japanese law and legislation be aligned with our own needs and actual situation. So uh, my question is about hidden power balance you mentioned during the discussion. Um, a, from our point of view and also my personal experience, I experienced my uh, case in the um, company, IT company, I started my career as IT engineer in the STEM field. <laughs> but I uh, got uh, victimized in the company uh, 25 years ago. And my perpetuator became the cyber security expert now. And I had to get up from the truck. Um, do you or the Nordic countries still have severe situation or do you have any improvement in the sexual violence in uh, work, uh, work environment as in a hidden power balance to prevent women from promoting the ladders? Thank you for sharing your experience. So for the sake of time, we don't have time for the each panel. So maybe, Hotler, can you uh, have the take time to ask, answer the question? Yeah. My question is very sensitive. Please do not share your, um, if you cannot answer my question, please skip. Um, please feel free. Well, 
I'll start and maybe my colleagues will, will add something. First of all, thank you for the work that you're doing, extremely important. Um, and thank you for bringing up this issue. I think in every country, this is a challenge in what one way or another. It depends on what scale, of course. And I will, uh, I, uh, I will uh, share that, you know, it's been um, both important to have very strict company policies. I think almost all company policies and agencies now have like uh, a clause on this particular issue like what and what it means to violate it what does it mean for the uh, uh, for the violator if, if 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 a violation happened so i've seen that change uh, in iceland um, over the uh, past years uh, and i've also seen that we have this incredible lady that is the head of our police in iceland and she's been doing fantastic job uh, on the legal frameworks as well. And I'd be happy to uh, share some examples with you. But thank you so much. OK, um, thank you again for sharing your experience. It means a lot to add to the discussion. Thank you so much. OK, so I think we need to wrap up. And I will hand my microphone to Ambassador. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much for being part of this event, these discussions this evening, very important topic and highly relevant. Uh, and Ryan, you framed it very well at, at the outset to not only talk about the challenges, but also focus on solutions. And that is exactly what I think our esteemed panelists and discussions have done, done uh, this evening. Um, there was... Uh, a lot of discussion, for example, about uh, hidden obstacles. Uh, part of that is in conscious bias. And uh, you discussed also the um, importance, for example, of paternity leave as a part of that. And to encourage and normalize uh, paternity leave. And I would hasten to add that in Iceland, and I'm sure the same goes in the other Nordic countries. Um, in Iceland, 90% of fathers take paternity leave three months on average. That's normalization. And it's, I would even dare to add that today, it's not only considered the right of young fathers to take paternity leave, it is expected of them to do it. And that's a very good place to be. And I'm sure it's the same in the other Nordic countries. Uh, Japan has very generous uh, paternity leave. But the problem is that fathers do not use it, only to a small degree. So that is your challenge, to normalize that. And that's also what I think role models that you have also thoroughly discussed is about. It's about normalizing, making it normal that women are in the lead, in, be it in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or other fields in, in, uh, in uh, our societies. And it pays off, as Hatla said. It pays off to empower women in STEM. And I'm sure that is a problem here in Japan. Uh, it is also a problem in, in the Nordic countries in spite of our uh, progress in uh, gender equality we still are not there in the STEM fields. And this undermines innovation uh, in our countries, which again undermines uh, welfare, economic growth and welfare in our countries. So this indeed needs to be addressed. It's a work in progress and we have to continue to focus on these issues. And it's so important, uh, someone mentioned that, to engage men. They should be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. And we have to find tools to engage them. And there are tools out there to do that. Um, and, uh, and you also talked about uh, alliances, partnership, mentoring, creating tools like Hatla mentioned, uh, Girls for Girls. Uh, to mentor these young girls and, and encourage them so that they feel uh, that they can do it just as the boys to go into these 
science and, and these other fields that we have been discussing. And, and uh, artificial intelligence, AI, AI, I think that was very intriguing as well, discussion we had. And the importance, again, to have women as key players in the development of artificial intelligence. We are on the cusp of a revolution where it has started. We don't know, nobody seems to know where this will lead us. So let's, and women need to uh, play a role there. Let's not wake up 20 years from now when I will be in my uh, 80s uh, and think, well, what did we do wrong, just as, as Hadla said. I could continue like this, uh, talk about tractors and, and uh, little girls driving them and, and all these experiences that you have shared with us. And these discussions will have been very important. They will resonate beyond this room. I want to thank our panelists for a very uh, encouraging, insightful comments and discussions. I want to thank our uh, moderator for uh, encouraging these dynamic discussions uh, today. I would like to thank the uh, University of Creativity for hosting us in this marvelous setting, Nordic Innovation House, for helping us to organize these events and other events under the chapeau of Nordic Talks. And all of you that have, are here today and have participated online for excellent uh, uh, input into the discussions. So I would like to end by saying in Icelandic, thank you for your participation. <laughs>